This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. All right, I think we're ready to start with our last session of the day. We saved the best for last. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, sorry, okay. <laughs> well, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Scott Schell, who will moderate the last session of the day on impact. Um, Scott is a chemical engineer who is renowned in our College of Engineering for his communication skills. He, um, he does this partly by the human connection that we've heard about today relating to people and, and, and being extremely likable. I'm sure you'll perceive that immediately once he comes up here. Um, but he, he also approaches this in a very methodical, thoughtful way and is involved in training our students in how to communicate well. So I'll leave it over to you, Scott. Thank you. Well, thank you, Susanna and Ron. It's a pleasure to be able to chair this session today. Um, one of the original speakers in the session, uh, Lisa, Lisa Liam Bruni, was not able to be here. She was called back on an urgent matter to Nova. So we have a little bit of extra time. And I was asked if I would talk a little bit about what I've done in helping, helping students learn how to communicate um, to this audience. So I'll take a few extra minutes if you'll allow me. I'm not a sustainability expert. I don't work in the area of sustainability. That's not my research. And I'm also not a communications expert. Um, what I do is help students in the College of Engineering and in the College of Sciences um, learn how to communicate technical work to each other and to the general public. And I've done this, I've got into this sort of by rote, just by learning what are effective strategies in my own career and by dabbling a little bit into other areas, other outlets about what makes for effective communication strategies. And I'm really motivated to do this because I view it as essential to their success in their careers. There is, you know, we're no longer in a period of time where you can publish a paper in a journal and expect that everyone in your field is going to read that paper and appreciate it. There's too much information out there. There's a deluge of things that are coming at us every day. There are new journals, new papers, all sorts of things. And so the role that public presentation, in particular oral talks, like the ones we've seen today, plays in science, not just in communicating to the public, but in inter-science communication, is very, very important, and it's growing in importance. And so I try and train my students to be able to communicate science effectively in a talk like this. I have kind of a unique perspective because I'm a theorist. So my research is all theory, I don't do experiments. And that can be very esoteric even when I'm giving presentations to other chemical engineering colleagues at other departments and seminars. And I have to think really hard about how to communicate theoretical concepts to an audience that's largely not full of theorists. And that's difficult because you can't throw a bunch of equations, I love to throw a bunch of equations up there, but I can't. And I also don't have a product. I don't make anything. I don't produce anything in the lab. My product is knowledge. So I really got into this business because of my own personal research and the way I communicate what I do in my career. So I'll tell you a little bit about the kinds of things that I tell undergraduates and graduate students and what are good strategies for communicating in a talk-like format. I'll limit it to a, a presentation kind of format like this. So maybe this will be interesting. It's, it's how I communicate about communicating science to undergraduates and the kinds of ways you have to be able to be clear to them. What I always ask them to do is to think back to the talks that they've seen. And for graduate students, this is really easy because they see them every week. And, and assess what made those talks successful. Which ones do they remember? So this particular session is about impact. And I would challenge all of you to think about what presentations, what talks have you seen that had a powerful impact on you. For me, it's not dazzling 
movies, it's not dazzling slides, it's not eloquence of the speaker, and it's not even the stories that they tell. It's, for me, it's really about the, the presentations that I remember years and years later are the ones where I learned something. I actually came away from them able to understand a difficult scientific concept that I didn't know previously, and it sticks with me. I can remember talks I saw in graduate school where I really learned something and I had that aha moment, and I remember that to this day. So for me, and what I try and tell my students when I'm teaching them about communicating science, is that there's an intrinsic element of learning and an element of teaching when you communicate science to each other and to the general public. And they can really latch on to that because they know what good teaching and bad teaching is. They've had to sit in really boring lectures and they know what's not successful. And they've also sat in lectures that are really exciting and engaging and they know what's successful. So I'll tell you sort of three points that I communicate to them about designing effective talks. The first is you have to give an interesting lecture. You have to generate interest. You have to make the person want to learn and adapt to. And we've heard a lot about the ingredients that help with that today. My postdoc advisor had a phenomenal short phrase that I think sums up exactly this point. You want to say why they care, not what you did. And the default mode that students approach presentations is what did I do? And instead you get them thinking about, well, why is the audience going to care? And part of that is infusing emotion. And in science, the emotions that are relevant are things like creativity, curiosity, excitement, discovery, accomplishment, and surprise. And if you can blend those into your talks, it really helps generate a lot of interest from your audience. This is all goes to this sort of tell a narrative, have a story, have a framework, find the right um, narrative by which to communicate your science. You can't tell that to students because they don't get that. That's very academic, especially undergraduates. So what I tell them is use the Scooby-Doo template. What's remarkable about Scooby-Doo is it has tremendous permanence. Every generation knows what Scooby-Doo is. It's not something that just my generation knows or the generation after me. That cartoon's been around forever. And they have a great template for how to tell a story. There's this interesting place to be. There's a mystery. There are some clues. There's a chase. The mystery is solved. There's a surprise ending. Set up a sequel. Right? That's a format that works for scientific stories. And students get that. Because the reason we're in this business of science is to solve these mysteries. And so you can frame it that way. So the Scooby-Doo model works really well for explaining to students how to communicate their work in a, in a presentation. The second thing I tell them if they think about teaching and lecturing and what makes for a good lecture is that you can't cover uh, everything in lecture. You, you don't learn everything in lecture alone. You have to go home. You have to do your homework. You have to read the book. That's where you're really learning the details. So in a lecture and in a talk, when you're communicating science more broadly and more generally in an oral format, you have to skip the details and emphasize the concepts. And it's the concepts that are key. And an audience is going to come away from your talk with really one, maybe two concepts, something they've learned. That's, that's even a high expectation, though. They walk away from one, from one talk having two concepts. One concept is pretty good. So you've got to aim to hit those kinds of points, and you have to think of a talk like a commercial or a preview of what, if you generate enough interest in your work, the audience will go back and learn more about it and pick up the details. And that's, that's a switch for students because they want to immediately convey all the details of their work to prove that they've done a lot of work and that they've, they know what they're talking about and they have an expertise. So I give them an example. You know, I could tell you if I'm giving a, a theory talk, we have this uh, theory that predicts system dynamics based on a multidimensional potential energy surface that we solve using a Gaussian distribution of saddles and a parabolic expansion around the extrema. That's a lot of details that doesn't really communicate the concept. Instead, I could say, you know, the dynamics of this system is basically existing on a really bumpy energy surface. The theory cares about the hills and the valleys, how many hills there are, and how high they are, and how sharp they are. And it sort of neglects everything else in between. That communicates the underlying concept, gets the point across without muddling it in all the detail. So the last thing that I tell students when I'm trying to emphasize what are the kinds of things that make for good teaching that translate to good communication is not to overload. 
don't teach too much. And for science and engineering students, this happens visually. They tend to put too much on their slides and they tend to go crazy with what they're trying to present and it causes the audience to tune out. I love um, Edward Tufte's work, who has authored the visual display of quantitative information, in particular because he has something that's great for engineering and science students. It's a rule of thumb that involves a ratio. So science and engineering students love math, they love ratios, they love numbers, this kind of thing. So Edward Tufte has this data ink ratio, which is a measure of how much information that you have that you're communicating on the page or on the screen, divided by how much stuff there is on there, how much ink or how much graphic or how much effort there is visually. And his suggestion is that you wanna maximize this data ink ratio. And it's a great principle for students because the science and engineering students will realize, huh, one way to maximize that ratio is to minimize the denominator. Minimize the amount of ink, the amount of stuff that's on the slide. And that immediately tells them, I've got to get rid of this incessant bulleted list addiction, where every single slide is a long list of text. That's a lot of ink. It dilutes out your ratio, and it makes it a lot lower. And so instead, what I emphasize, I actually tell my grad students, you're going on the PowerPoint diet. Bulleted lists are empty calories. They're like carbs. They're bad. Reduce them. And it's hard to do at first because it's very easy to punch into a bulleted list exactly what you want to say. But I say instead, you know, think about this as a totally blank canvas. That's the first thing. Second thing, think what's the concept you're trying to get across? What's the one idea on that slide? Then make it happen econ economically and simply with a visual image or a diagram or a figure that or a graph that conveys exactly that concept as best as possible and workshop that. You may not be the best artist, but first identify what you need and then later on you can figure out a way to get there. So those are the kinds of things that I communicate to undergraduate and graduate students about how to communicate science. And again, I'm not an expert in science communication per se or in sustainability, but I think these are useful things that many people, many scientists such as myself, are very interested in getting our students to do because we know it's critical for their careers. So I won't talk anymore. I'll give time for the speakers in our session um, today. <laughs> Uh, who are going to discuss uh, impact. So our first speaker is Saul Hart, who is an assistant professor in both communication studies and the program in the environment at the University of Michigan. Uh, Saul received his master's degree in environmental studies from the University of Oregon and then his PhD in communication at Cornell. At Michigan, he specializes in risk communication related to environmental science and risk issues. His research looks at the role of the media in motivating and engaging the public, and it examines how to create effective messages that cross ideological divides and resonate broadly with the public. Uh, Professor Hart's research is supported by a variety of organizations, including the National Science Foundation, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and his work has been published in a wide variety of prestigious journals, including the Journal of Communication, Communication Research, and Science Communication. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Saul Hart. This awesome. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Saul Hart. Uh, it's great to talk to you today. Is there a way to get the presentation on the screen also? That would be awesome. Okay. But while, while they're working on that, uh, so I have two studies um, that I'm going to present to you today. The first uh, is media analysis, um, and the second is uh, results from a survey that we conducted. The first study is a study that I did with Lauren Feldman at Rutgers University, uh, looking at how climate change is covered in the news. So first, a very short bio of me, I'm really interested in environmental psychology. And so that's both how are messages portrayed in the media sphere, how do people respond to those messages. Um, and so what this looks at specifically is if we view uh, the news agencies as a persuasive actor, how are they talking about threat? How are they talking about efficacy, and how might that shift public opinion on the issue? 
Uh, Y'all already know this, but this is just to show that, hey, we're polarized on climate change. Um, back in the late 90s, there actually wasn't a huge partisan divide. In the last uh, 15, 20 years, um, it's dramatically increased. Okay, so first I wanna give a touch of theory for the communication scholars. Part of what this is doing is it's trying to merge, um, there's a model called the extended parallel process model, so it's trying to merge that approach to uh, threat and efficacy with a political science approach. So here's a very quick version of the extended parallel process model. It's very concerned with threat and efficacy, and the idea is basically you use threat to get someone's attention, but if you don't pair that threat with actions that can be taken to address the issue, uh, people generally will um, go into maladaptive responses where they start to ignore the issue because it's like, oh God, you're freaking me out, but there's nothing we can do, I better run away. Right? Uh, and it focuses on two types of efficacy. One is self-efficacy, can I do something? And the second is response efficacy, will that action make a difference? So if you think of a, say, a smoking, you would say smoking's gonna kill you, stop smoking, but you can quit and it'll improve your health. Right? That, that would include all those elements. So that's the EPPM. Again, we have uh, self-efficacy and we have response efficacy. Now the thing is, I'm really interested in climate change. And climate change is not, for a lot of the actions, it's not about just what I can do, it's about what are the policy responses. And so to look into that, Lauren and I, we said, okay, what about what the political science says about this? And here the efficacy is a little bit different. There's still internal efficacy, which is pretty similar to self-efficacy. Instead it's more like, can I write a letter to a congressman? Uh, can I protest? But the second part is, will the political leaders actually respond to that? Um, and our thought is, okay, we have different definitions, how can we merge this together? And we ended up with uh, this combined model, which is basically, can I do something? Will political leaders respond? And then will that response actually make a difference? And so that is what we were interested in coding for uh, when we looked at the media, and specifically, what's the representation of these three different types of efficacy? So there's the short primer on efficacy and what we're doing there. Uh, the next uh, part of this, which we're also integrating, is looking at framing. Um, and framing is basically just what are the, uh, the overall way the issue is portrayed to the public. Um, our definition of, actually, of it builds from a framework uh, first performed actually by Matt Nisbet, who's here. Um, and so it's just looking at what are different types of thematic frames that are there. You can talk about climate change as an environmental issue, as a, a safety issue, a national security issue, um, as an economic issue, or as a health issue. And so we looked at how are actions um, to address climate change and the impacts differentially framed as well. Um, okay, we'll go through that. Heavy text, bad. More heavy text, oh, it's horrible. All right, but uh, here's, the, here's the brief on the method. Um, I just want you to know this is full census. So we looked from 2005 to 2011 um, on network news. So this is ABC, CBS, NBC. And we pulled every single uh, news transcript addressing us, addressing this. Um, and uh, just you know, for the coding, this was presence absence coding, and we used three uh, graduate research assistants to do it. Um, I don't have the uh, intercoder reliability here, but everything is above 0.7. Most of them are in the 0.8 to 0.9 range um, for the different variables. Okay, so here are the results. So first, uh, for the overall coverage. Um, this is what it looked like. This huge peak that you see um, at the very end of 2009, beginning of, uh, that's December 2009, um, and that's ClimateGate. Uh, so that showed a huge spike in interest right then for, in terms of news coverage of climate change. Um, but you do see that there are these waves um, of coverage, and a lot of that is around, is there a conference going on? Um, is there a major national report that just came out? And that tends to drive a lot of the coverage of the issue. One of the critical things that we were so interested in is our impacts and actions discussed together. And so, I know you're already looking at the graph, but just listen for a second, and then we'll go back to the graph. Uh, and the idea between the extended parallel process model, again, is that if you're gonna talk about impacts, it is critical to pair that information on impacts with actions that can be taken on the issue. Um, and so again, this is from a persuasive actor perspective. And what this graph is showing is that typically those two messages are totally decoupled. That a story focuses either on the impacts of climate change or on the actions that can be taken to address it. Um, 
Just to walk through it briefly, uh, so the bottom left, those two lines are when there's no climate change impacts discussed. On the right is when there are uh, impacts discussed. The blue is, is that there's no action, and the red is that there is action. And so what you see is that on the left, when there's no climate change impacts being discussed, there's a lot more discussion of action, and the reverse happens when there are climate change impacts. So again, um, those stories tend to be decoupled. Uh, we also looked at, okay, what's the story about how impacts are actually discussed? So for timing, uh, it tends to be now or in the future, but the predominant discussion is, hey, climate change is already happening. Here are these impacts that we're already seeing. For the location, primarily in the U.S., um, which was a little bit surprising because some earlier uh, analyses of this had said basically it's in foreign countries, but we found that at least with new U.S. network news, they really are talking about U.S. impacts. Um, and for efficacy information, so again, I know, I feel right after Scott talked, I'm like, oh God, this is text heavy. Uh, but I want you to pay attention to the bottom numbers, um, which is response efficacy. Will this policy make an impact? And that is the predominant efficacy information being provided. Um, there's almost no discussion of what could someone actually do individually about this issue in the news coverage. Um, and the second aspect of this is that uh, I don't have the overall efficacy, but positive and negative efficacy information are roughly balanced. Um, there's about as much, hey, you can do something as there is, no, there's nothing that will work, right? And those two are fairly balanced in the literature. Um, the other thing is that unlike impacts and actions, positive and negative efficacy are generally discussed in tandem with each other. Um, so when there was negative efficacy information, 84.5% of the time it included positive efficacy information. On the other hand, only 4% of the time um, for, was it just positive information alone. Right? Why is that? Because typically what's happening in a network news article is they're saying, hey, there's this new policy that someone proposed to address climate change. Do you think it will work? Advocate, yes, it will work. Um, skeptic, no, it'll never work, right? And they put them head to head, and then there's this mixed message that comes out. But the result is you have very muddled efficacy for will these actions work at all. And the last component to this is um, what was a bit uh, methodologically new is that we looked at actions and impacts separately in terms of framing. Um, most of the research looking at framing climate change messages just looked at the story as a whole. And here we found that there were really strong differences. Impacts were primarily framed as environmental impacts. The glaciers are melting, the polar bears are gonna die, those types of messages. Um, actions, though, were not about here's how that might benefit the environment if we take action on it. Um, also generally did not talk about uh, health issues um, or national security. It was really about the conflict and strategy component. It was really about here's a proposed action, here's the competitive fight between Democrats and Republicans of whether it'll happen. And here's some nonprofit groups uh, thrown in the mix as well. So the overall takeaway points that we have here are number one, um, impacts and actions are discussed separately. We have a pretty clear threat discussion. Uh, the threat discussion really is, hey, climate change is serious, it is causing this impacts, it is affecting the US already, but the efficacy message is very muddled, right? Um, and then just the impacts are framed as in terms of the environment, action is framed in terms of conflict, so we have those three things. When you put them together and you think of the news as a persuasive actor, what's the likely takeaway from that? It might be that, right? Um, the implication that, okay, there's a serious issue, it is affecting things, but I don't know if this will work, may cause people to ignore this. Um, now this is a content analysis. There isn't a behavioral component to it. So what Lauren and I are doing now is actually experimentally testing this. If we use higher low levels of efficacy, if we include threat information or not, how does that shift public opinion? Um, and so some of that's under review and some of that we're doing this summer. And so results to come soon, so got the sequel, okay. Um, <laughs> So, so that's, that's a constant analysis. Um, this next piece just came out, and I think it really relates to the conversation that we've been having throughout. Um, this uh, is a study I did with Eric Nisbet, who's Matt Nisbet's brother. He's a professor at Ohio State University, and then Teresa Myers, who's at George Mason University. Uh, and this um, was published online in Nature Climate Change in April. Um, and there's a really long 
title. Okay, what we're interested primarily is um, how attention to news influences policy and this deficit model compared to the motivated reasoning model. A lot of you have already heard this, so I won't spend a lot of time defining it, but just briefly again, the deficit model, if we give people knowledge, their opinion will tend to move in line with the scientific consensus. The motivated reasoning model, on the other hand, is that people tend to interpret information in ways that reinforce the values and beliefs that they already hold. Right? And oftentimes these are held in opposition. Our question was, okay, if we look at some survey data, what does it tell us about these or do they co-occur? And spoiler, they co-occur. Okay. Um, we, uh, and what we're interested in is attention to science as compared to political news. And so attention to science and environmental news, um, it tends to tell a more straight story. It tends to be more factually correct. Um, political news often is more of a debating talking heads format where um, the information isn't always as reliable, but you also have much more polarized viewpoints being expressed. Uh, so this was a nationally representative survey. Um, as mediators, we were interested in both knowledge and perceived harm. And I'm gonna show you a, a really fun graph. You were like, I was waiting all day to see something like this. Um, it's, uh, but we're, we'll break it down. So those numbers are a little small. You don't, if, if you don't like numbers, you can just ignore it and I'll, I'll explain what it means. Uh, so first, looking first at attention to science news. So we're comparing attention to science news with attention to political news. So the influence of science news on knowledge increases. And there's two numbers there. The top number is very strong liberals, the bottom number is very strong conservatives. And that's gonna be true throughout the graph. And so attention to science and environmental news increases knowledge more for liberals, but increases both liberal and conservative knowledge. If we look down at harm, um, the, uh, the attention here to science news doesn't shift harm views for liberals, but for conservatives, it does increase uh, perceptions of harm. Just so you know, basically what that looks like is liberals are, are flat, they aren't changing, and then conservatives are underneath and moving up towards the li liberal view of harm. So um, I do have a graph at the very end if you wanna see the graph of that. But with political tension, we get a very different story. There's no influence at all at, at knowledge. Um, but with harm, we get an interesting story, I think, in that the perception of harm for conservatives has a very strong negative association with attention to political news. And I think the reason for that is, based on the motivated reasoning literature, is that, hey, if you see talking heads, but I'm already a little skeptical of climate change, and I see someone who's espousing my view and debating against someone else, it's good to harden those skeptical views that I already hold. Um, but there is some hope here for the deficit model. Uh, increased levels of knowledge were associated with uh, higher levels of perception of harm for liberals and conservatives, right? So that worked fairly well across the political spectrum. Um, looking at how that influences policy su support, inf increasing harm did increase policy support across the political spectrum. You actually see this huge bump for conservatives um, in terms of that. But knowledge, you find this interesting finding. It increases it for liberals, but it decreases it for conservatives. And I think what's happening is as knowledge increases for conservatives, there also can be more counter-arguing that occurs with that. Um, if you think of the very knowledgeable skeptic, right, that could be that there. Looking at the direct effects, we actually see similar results, which is that attention for the direct relationship um, had negative results for conservatives, whether it was political attention or science attention. Okay, that's the whole model. If, you're, if you know structural equation modeling, the question is, okay, so what's the total effect? More fun numbers. Um, but the bottom line is that when you look at attention to science news, um, you see for a total effect, a positive effect for strong liberals. You basically see no effect across the rest of the political spectrum. We look at the effect of political news, there's no effect for liberals, um, but you see all these lots of stars and lots of negative numbers on the bottom. Basically, attention to political news for conservatives, the overall effect is decreased support for climate change um, when we look at the overall effect. Okay, so the take home message from this, is that this probably isn't helping, right? Having someone like Bill Nye go on and debate, um, you know, whether it's a congressman or, or a skeptic, um, it's probably not shifting liberal views that much, but it is actually reinforcing skeptical ideas from the conservative audience. Um, 
So that's, that's not really hopeful, I guess, right? It's just saying that um, I think if we can advocate for science and environmental news, that's helpful because it doesn't cause this kind of backfire or boomerang effect um, of increasing skepticism and hardening opposition. But that's a real challenge, right? Because this kind of talking head format um, is really entertaining and a lot of people enjoy viewing it. Uh, just so you know, there is, I guess, the little tinge of hope is that science news attention that gray is not showing up great. But uh, this is the relationship between scientists, scientific news and harm. And that's just showing that as scientific news attention increase, um, the conservative, which is that bottom line, is, moves up to the liberal views. And also, as perceptions of harm increase, um, you see that uh, policy support does increase across the political spectrum. And you see fairly strong gains um, amongst conservative audiences. Thank you so much. Saw. Our second speaker in this session is Professor Andrew Nelson, who's an associate professor of management, also a Bramson faculty fellow in innovation, entrepreneurship, and sustainability, and the academic director of the Lundquist Center for Entrepreneurship at the University of Oregon. He received his PhD in management science and engineering at Stanford, and also holds a master's of science from Oxford University. His research explores entrepreneurship, commercialization, and the origin and evolution of new technology-based fields. His projects focus on green sustainable chemistry, biotechnology, digital music, and information technology. He's authored two books, The Sound of Innovation, Stanford and the Computer Music Revolution, and Technology Ventures from Idea to Enterprise. And his work has appeared in a variety of prestigious journals, including the Ac Academy of Management Journal and Research Policy. So please join me in welcoming Professor Nelson. What a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. It's, you seem so far off out there. It's, uh, um, it, I have to start by thanking Lucy for showing that wonderful clip from Portlandia. Uh, as an Oregonian, we look at that show and it, it's actually not comedy or even satire, it's just it's pure documentary. So it's, it's, it's fun to share my life with you, but I think to be in a sympathetic audience, I suspect there are a few of you who appreciate calling the chicken out there. So um, now that I'm up here, I, I also have to make a bit of an admission. Uh, it's too late to withdraw the invitation. And, and that is that I actually don't consider myself to have any special expertise and science communication. So I'm, I'm a little bit of an, of an interloper here. I think the reason you may have invited me is that I do have, have a little bit of expertise, at least, in the commercialization of science and scientific research. And so I want to take this unifying theme we have of impact from this session, and I want to interpret it in, in two different ways. The first is the way that, that Saul uh, made reference to and that you've heard a lot about today, and that is the impact of communication efforts themselves. Uh, I'd like to focus on a second interpretation interpretation, and that interpretation is how can sustainable science itself actually have impact? How can the scientific research have impact? What I mean by this is that if you look around the University of California at Santa Barbara, or you look around universities across the state of California, across the West, across the U.S., around the world, you will see a tremendous amount of research being accomplished. You will see faculty members, you will see graduate students, undergraduates, career researchers conducting a tremendous amount of scientific research. The production of research does not seem to be our primary problem. Our primary challenge, I would argue, lies in the commercialization of that research, or rather, as my economist friends like to phrase it, in the difference between invention, coming up with the initial thing, and innovation translating that thing into something which is socially or economically, and, and I would add environmentally, meaningful or impactful. If you need some evidence that this is a challenge, you can turn to the US Patent and Trademark Office. A lot of times people who don't study patents think that patents are somehow associated with innovation. It's actually not true. If you look through the US PTO records, you will find that the vast, vast majority of patents never actually have any commercial value, zero. If you need another piece of evidence, look at the technology licensing offices at most every university. 
These are offices which scrape together the most promising inventions of faculty researchers and graduate students and others. The vast, vast majority of invention disclosures to technology licensing offices are never even licensed, let alone developed into the innovations that we would actually care about. So this, it turns out, is a, is a major, major problem. This is the model that we usually have of the innovation process. I stole this particular graphic you can see from the British Columbia Institute of Technology, and yet if you go to most any university website around the world, you'll see something similar portrayed. It's something that we call the linear model, uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that uh, but, and where that came from, but the process essentially looks like this. A researcher has an idea. She develops a proof of concept for that idea. She engages in product development. She engages in pre-commercial trials and sales. And then this thing enters full-fledged commercial production. And a successful innovation is born. Of course, along the way, there are lots and lots of barriers and roadblocks to the process. Where do we find customers for this? How do we attract employees to our venture? Where do we go out and raise the capital to make this happen? How do we find lab space and production facilities in order for this to happen? Many, many barriers. <laughs> There's another challenge with the linear model, however, and that is that it's actually wrong. This is not what the process looks like. The linear model is usually ascribed to Vannevar Bush, and many of you recognize him as the guy who wrote Science, the Endless Frontier, and used that as justification to set up the National Science Foundation. And the linear model has a very attractive property, and that is that it is simple and easy to understand. If you are trying to make a case to Congress as to why they should fork over money to support basic research, this helps you make the case. Because as we've heard all day, most Congress people actually don't care all that much about publications and nature and science and cell and PNAS and all the other places that we spend our careers aspiring to publish in but they do care about commercial sales. And their constituents do care about buying stuff. And increasingly, they care, their constituents at least, about the environment. At least we hope they do. And this is a model which says if you feed basic research, what you will get out of the other end are good commercial products which can influence all sorts of aspects of life, including the environment in positive ways. So what's the problem with this? Well, one problem is that it assumes by its very nature that basic science feeds applied science, which fuels engineering. And if you actually study innovation, many innovations proceed with blissful ignorance of the actual underlying science that's taking place. Jerry Barnett, who's a well-renowned IP management consultant, offers two examples. The first, he says, is information technology. These are his words. He says, look at the leaders of the major companies, Gates and Allen, Jobs and Wozniak, Brin and Page, Zuckerberg. These folks were practitioners, most without college degrees. And now computer science departments are all abuzz in the space that these folks created. The second example Jerry offers is the case of warfarin, which is both an effective rat poison and a life-saving blood thinner. But the science of how this compound actually works came decades after we were already using it. In fact, if you look at the innovation literature, it is filled with as many examples in which the science lagged engineering as it is of science leading to engineering breakthroughs. Now, as these examples signal, there's another problem with the linear model, and that is that it neglects the feedback loops that actually characterize the innovation process. Oftentimes, engaging in this process, you have new insights from potential customers. You have accidental research results that develop uh, in the course of building a prototype. You have new results from outside groups and other influences which lead you to question your original assumptions. So in light of this, innovation scholars have proposed some alternative models. I don't know if these qualify as, as elegant infographics or not. This one probably not. But they include all sorts of feedback loops and arrows going in different directions. This is the, quote, chain-linked model by Nate Rosenberg and, uh, and Klein. This is a model I show my students when I teach them entrepreneurship. <laughs> Entrepreneurs, like many, uh, like many research scientists, are very good at taking the end point and then constructing this revisionist history of how 
the upper left led to the lower right. But in the moment, it's the messiness that seems to matter. So my point here in showing you this is that added to this whole laundry list of commercialization challenges, financial resources, customer relationships, physical space, hiring, all of those things, we have to add the inherent nonlinearity and unpredictability of the innovation process itself. In fact, I think the mystery is not that so little research gets out of the university and into the world to make a difference. I think the mystery is that any of it makes it out at all when you look at this. So I don't want to just wrap this in doom and gloom and, and end on a, on a negative note here. Uh, I want to assure you that scholars of innovation have looked at this process and they have lots and lots of helpful advice. Tips such as interact with your customers frequently. For example, one of Edison's first inventions was a vote tabulating machine for Congress. Any of you know this story? Edison invents the vote tabulating machine, only then presents it to members of Congress to find out that they don't actually want their votes tabulated more quickly and more transparently than, than they had been. And Edison, on the basis of this, decides that he is never again going to develop an invention until he has some sense of what the market is for that invention. And we might think about applying that in a sustainability context as well. Another point which has been offered by innovation scholars is that the best technologies, of course, don't always win. Consider the example of the Concorde jet in the Boeing 747. By most of the metrics that engineers care about, the Concorde is the superior product. It's more technologically advanced. It flies at twice the speed of the Boeing 747. The challenge is that its fuel costs are 15 times that per passenger mile than those of the 747. So for the market, twice the speed at 15 times the cost isn't an equation that works regardless of engineers' enthusiasm for the product. Beta versus VHS. Arguably, the Beta format offers better picture quality for video recording. And yet, because there is no or was no large established library of Beta recordings of, of commercial releases, VHS is the format that wins. And we see example and example and example of this in the information, excuse me, in the innovation literature. But the reason I point to this is to remind us that the challenges here of commercializing science aren't actually primarily technical challenges or even scientific challenges. They are social challenges. Uh, now, I don't want to go too far off track on, on, on the challenges and the, um, and the advice and best practices around commercialization without linking it to the actual theme of this conference, uh, which is communication. So to make this link, I want to try to sell you on a simple proposition, and this is it. Science communication is fundamental to science commercialization. Science communication is fundamental to science commercialization. So to illustrate this point, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, hopefully this is an effective format as, as we've heard. I don't know that it's a great story, but I'll, I'll pretend it is. Uh, and it's a story of a field called green chemistry. So this is a field that emerged in the 1990s in response to concerns uh, about environmental challenges tied to chemical pollution. Uh, so I'm actually not going to focus on global warming and greenhouse gas emissions. Though those aren't totally disconnected. Petroleum is the common factor. Uh, but rather, I'm focusing here on the effects of toxic chemicals in the environment. So you can think here of big headline-worthy events. This is from the Bhopal, India disaster. This is Love Canal. This is one of the 13 different Cuyahoga River fires. But we can also think of everyday less headline-worthy events in which the production and use of household, industrial, and agricultural chemicals has negative environmental effects. I think a nod here to Rachel Carson is, is more than appropriate, uh, who first raised public awareness of some of these challenges more than 50 years ago. Now, traditionally, the way that we have dealt with these challenges is what we might call an end-of-pipe approach. After we produce these things, then we contain them or we dilute them. Or, as is often the case, we do neither of those things. And the basic idea of green chemistry is to employ an alternative approach that instead attempts to mitigate these environmental impacts from the design stage forward. So the formal definition offered by two of the founders of this field is the design of chemical products or processes that reduce or eliminate the use or generation of hazardous substances. 
But that's, that's a little too clear. Let me just show you some chemistry because I think there's no way to engage an audience at, at four o'clock in the afternoon than, than uh, no better way than showing some chemistry. So this is the traditional synthesis process for making ibuprofen. This is something that many of us uh, depend upon uh, at various points. And what you should keep your eye on here is the ending molecule. That's what you care about. The rest of this is process. And the traditional process for producing ibuprofen generates about three bottles of waste for two bottles of actual product. Three bottles of waste for two bottles of product. If you look at very advanced pharmaceuticals, that ratio tends to be upwards of a thousand to one. A thousand parts chemical waste for one part product that we actually care about. Now I sit in a business school, and this actually isn't a tough claim even to make, uh, or a tough sell even to business leaders, because they look at waste and they see, well, this is a problem on the input side, I'm paying for it, and it's a problem on the output side because I have to do something with this waste. In some industries, upwards of 50% of their R&D budgets are being spent on remediation rather than actual research. So this is one of those rare instances where, where everyone seems to be on board. And green chemistry comes along and says, let's redesign the process. Keep your eye on the ending molecule there. It's exactly the same. But let's redesign the process. And the Boots Company did this and now generates three bottles of ibuprofen for less than one bottle of waste. We still have the same ending product and yet we have a tremendous improvement in the environmental footprint of that product. Together with many colleagues uh, at University of Oregon and the University of New Hampshire, and I should point out critically, our research team is not just management scholars. We have as many chemists as we do management scholars on our research team. I think that's important so that as a, as a non-chemist, I can actually uh, engage in the science in a serious way. And our research team has been exploring this field of green chemistry. Where did it come from? How did it grow? How have innovations been commercialized? This is one graphic to give you a sense of the field's growth. The red line here is tracking annual publications in the field. You can see some of the major events, such as the establishment of presidential awards by the White House, the formalization of 12 principles, which I'll tell you more about momentarily, the establishment of a formal journal, and in 2005, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry is awarded on the basis of this underlying science. In other words, you might consider this a case of successful commercial commercialization. And yet there's also something pretty interesting about green chemistry. As my colleagues and I poked around this field and tried to understand its evolution, we heard statements like this from chemists. The only objection to green chemistry is from within chemistry. We've talked a lot about public skepticism of science and especially climate change science, and yet this is a field where chemists themselves are skeptical about this approach. In some cases, this is simply due to ignorance. In other cases, this is due to a sense that science actually should not have a normative element. Science should be value-free and not carry forward sustainability values. In some cases, this is due to a sense that sustainable science must somehow be soft. And there's a wonderful quote, I didn't insert it in the slide deck, but where one of our informants equates sustainable sciences to the basket weaving of the sciences and goes on to explain that if you didn't do well in physics uh, or chemistry or biology, then you went into environmental something. So these were all different responses that chemists had, some chemists, to the emerging field of green chemistry. What I'd like to do is to show you six specific tactics that advocates of green chemistry have engaged in in order to communicate this science to their colleagues, to other chemists. So these are the six practices. The first thing they did is to come up with a set of 12 principles, 12 easily identified scientific practices in which other chemists could engage if they wanted to do this kind of science. And you can see them there. I actually, I left it in my bag, unfortunately, but this is a little wallet card. It's something you can put in your purse or in your wallet and carry around with you. And this is important, as one of our interviewees told us, because the principles define a set of criteria and scientific principles to deduce from the many things that you can do which ones actually have an impact on sustainability. Another one said the 12 principles gave something tangible that differentiated green chemistry from all those sustainability gurus. This was something that could be taught in the chemistry class. This is a science that's really tied to the nuts and bolts molecular level of how you do something. The point is that simplicity aids communication, which aids implementation. 
A second point is that advocates of green chemistry abandoned absolutes to instead encourage relative improvements. So they've shied away from forcing potential adoptees to adopt all 12 of these principles in order to be considered a green chemist. In fact, the people who came up with these 12 principles said that they started with 10 and then shifted that to 12 because 10 sounded too much like the 10 commandments and they wanted to stay away from that association. So, as one person told us, we never said, thou shall do this. And as another said, the principles showed that all things being equal, this is better than that. It doesn't say you have to optimize all 12 principles at the same time. In fact, I think the founders will tell you that it's rare, if not impossible, to do so. The third communication practice they have used is to have different messages for different audiences. To industry, therefore, they talked about efficiency and optimization. You can get high yield and higher quality rather than generating a tremendous amount of waste. When they would pitch this to academics, they would talk about design of new products and how this would enable you to do new things that therefore can get published in the journals. To students, they would emphasize the sustainability and the earth-saving elements of this and position this as science which is worthwhile to engage in as an undergraduate or graduate student. And they also appreciated that as they positioned this in different parts of the world, different messages would resonate. As one early advocate told us, when we met up with Italy, we knew it was probably going to happen in an academic environment. A couple years later, when we were engaging with Japan, we knew that it was going to be industry driven. Down in Australia, it was government. Over in the UK, it was academic. So these emerged in different ways and that was fine. Different messages for different audiences. Fourth, central to this approach is that green chemistry advocates have tried to meet people where they already are. One thing they did is to seek out those chemists who already seemed to be engaged in environmental practices but didn't claim the label green chemist or associate with the community. So one advocate said, I'll go and talk to folks and say, are you doing green chemistry? And they'll say, no, um, I'm just trying to make a material that you don't have to compound plasticizer to make it soft. Wow, but they don't see that as green chemistry. Or they'll say, I'm trying to get rid of this waste stream because it's really nasty but they don't see it as green chemistry. And so what we help them do is to get this into the language that they're already talking and make that connection. Another advocate said that the whole point of this approach is that you start recognizing a person for doing green chemistry and all of a sudden their next research proposal is different. All of a sudden their next lecture is different. In other cases, however, they took a different tack. They sought out those people who seemed friendly to the environmental rhetoric and tried to provide them with a set of technical practices in a technical field in which they could engage. And one of the people they approached shared with our research team, I wanted a long time ago since I was a student to help the environment, but I'm not the guy, kind of guy who's a political activist. And my activist friends would say, well, you're a chemist, aren't you contributing to the problem? And this particular informant went on to share that green chemistry provides him with the tools to match his environmental interest with his scientific practice. Another person shared, you do chemistry in a certain way because that's the way it's always been done. You use these very bad solvents. I probably personally put my own hole in the ozone layer with the freon I used in grad school. But once I was exposed to green chemistry, it just fit into what I was doing with all the other parts of my life, like trying to recycle when I can and that sort of stuff. Again, the tactic here is to find that piece that resonates with that particular audience member and to use that as the foot in the door to introduce the rest of the field. The fifth thing here was to look to the edges. Green chemistry advocates did not focus exclusively or even primarily on what we might term the usual suspect institutions. So as our research team looked at green chemistry research publications, we found, and you can see on the slide behind me, that the leading institutions historically were the US EPA, the Delft University of Technology, University of York, Monash University, and the University of Alabama. And if we look at educational and pedagogical materials and publications, we find the University of Oregon, University of Glasgow, Merrimack College, Colorado School of the Mines, and Millikan University. In both data sets, Harvard, UC Berkeley, MIT, Caltech, Stanford, and I might add UCSB, were amongst the least active institutions. Now, I should also add that these elite institutions have since caught up. UC Berkeley, for example, has a wonderful uh, and very important green chemistry center. But my point here is that if you focused both outbound and inbound communication on the usual suspects, the elite, the elite universities, you would have actually missed some of the earliest and most important activity taking place in this environmental field. 
And the final thing here is that green chemists have learned to appreciate the diversity within these different types of institutions. That is, I think we often make the mistake of thinking of universities as like other universities and industry as industry. And that's not in fact the case. Even within these types, we have very different resource bases, very different motivations, very different goals, all of which shape engagement in new innovative practices. Why did University of Oregon get into green chemistry? Money. They couldn't afford fume hoods to pack more and more undergraduates into chemistry labs. And if you take a green chemistry approach, you don't need fume hoods to teach them chemistry. But other universities were motivated by other reasons. Financing, a desire to respond to a donor's will, a desire to engage in cutting edge science, different motivations. If we look on the industry side, pharmaceutical companies have been particularly receptive to green chemistry in large part because they can use it to extend their patent protection. But bulk commodity chemical firms have been skeptical and even hostile to the field because they already have sunk costs in their production processes and green chemistry calls attention to the environmental impacts of their current approaches. The point is that even within a single category such as universities or industry, we have a great amount of diversity. In fact, even if you look within a single institution, as I'm gonna show you here, you will typically find a wide array of different departments engaged in the field of green chemistry. And the point of this is that the levers that work with the individuals in this wide array of departments and the communication approaches that resonate with them are of course going to be very, very different. So my point here is actually one that I think we've been hearing all day, and that is that science communication is not something that's one size fits all. Green chemistry shows us that communication can be a challenge, in fact, to accomplish even within your own scientific discipline. And then when you start reaching across to different disciplines and different institutions and different kinds of institutions and different geographies appealing to different constituencies, the challenge as we've heard all day, can be enormous. But my own sense is that the opportunity is enormous too. Ultimately, I think the link here between communication and commercialization is important because I think we not only care about communicating science, I think we actually care about these findings from the lab not only being understood and appreciated by fellow scientists, by policymakers, by the media, and by the general public, but actually used by all these different groups to improve their lives. And what we've learned through studying green chemistry here is that these two activities, the communication piece and the commercialization piece go hand in hand. Not in some straight linear path like we beat up earlier, it's a bumpy windy trail, but they support each other to achieve this common good. So if I may, I'd like to wrap up with a quote uh, from one of our informants uh, that I found particularly salient. Uh, he said, we're under attack as chemists for constantly polluting, for causing all the problems, and now all of a sudden there are people saying, now we're part of the solution, and we have a responsibility and also the means to solve problems. Chemistry is the science of molecules, and if we use the right principles to make the right decisions, we can really make a difference. So hats off to all of you out there for making a difference, and thank you very much.